Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, we'll be getting started in a minute. My name is Tamao Nakahara. I run the developer experience team here at Weaveworks. Hopefully you are here for this workshop that uh, will not only give you sort of an intro to Kubernetes and GitOps, so the two in the context in, with each other, uh, but also you have your laptops ready because we're actually going to walk you through uh, all the steps of getting started with um, one of our free open source tools called Weave GitOps that um, will help you not only you know, understand the concepts around GitOps if you're new to it, but actually be able to try it uh, on your own laptops. So hopefully you all, you're all here for that uh, and you have your laptops ready. Uh, we have um, upwards of two hours. We usually finish these in about 90 minutes, but um, we've been kind of giving more of the talks in the beginning. So we have a, a blocked time of two hours. So don't be shy. We will be waiting for everybody. We'll be helping you troubleshoot. We want to make sure that everybody is able to have a successful experience with Weave GitOps. So hopefully you are prepared for that. And uh, there are no dumb questions. So we will help you through that. So excellent. Uh, with that, I will do a quick intro. Uh, so like I said, we'll have a talk in the beginning and then do um, kind of a workshop. And I'm fortunate to have with me um, a couple of people who will be um, giving the intro talks as well as um, uh, doing the actual walkthrough. And Stacy, if you could advance the slide. Um, quick thing, uh, we all work for a company called Weaveworks. Uh, so Mark E. Nice, David Harris and I, and Stacy is in the background, our community manager putting this together. Um, if you've never heard of us before, then welcome. Uh, we are a company that's based um, before COVID, we're fairly distributed, but before COVID, we had offices in London, San Francisco, New York, Berlin, um, and uh, probably have those up again as well. Uh, we are very founded on open source. If you may have heard of us or heard of Weave things, uh, then you know you might have heard of WeaveNet uh, that we've had from the earliest days for networking. Um, and then there are many, many more list than listed here, but I'll just highlight some of the few that are in the CNCF. So Flux and Flagger uh, are probably our most famous right now. Um, we are in incubation, just went through our security audit to get to graduation. We're very, very close and very excited about how this whole process has gone, uh, really gained a lot of confidence as well on you know, how well we've designed Flux. And Flux has really triggered the, uh, the term GitOps. Our um, CEO coined that term after some of the experiences that we had uh, building and using Flux. Uh, another project I'll call out to is Cortex, which is also in the CNCF, and uh, that sort of uh, extends and uh, adds capabilities to Prometheus, um, which ultimately becomes all very important because um, Flagger, which we have folded into Flux, uh, provides pro progressive delivery, such as Canary deployments and blue-green, and uh, a lot of times it is based on data that you would get from Prometheus slash Cortex. Um, you can get it from other places as well, but that was sort of the first ways in which we designed it. So a lot of great technology and innovation and actual users um, that we've seen uh, that uh, use these projects and more. So if you're new to us, welcome. And our website is weave.works. So check us out if you have any questions. Uh, Stacy, thanks. Um, I'm going to mention uh, what's really exciting is that, um, is my volume low? Sorry, someone made a comment. Um, let me know if anybody else. OK, but um, if you. I don't know. I, okay. I hear you all right. Yeah, hopefully you can crank up the volume when I'm speaking. Um, but yeah, let me know if anybody else has an issue. Um, what's really exciting about um, Weave GitOps, which again, as I mentioned, is free and open source, is that it is built on Flux that I just mentioned, right? And it really helps to broaden the types of people who would like to get started with GitOps. Um, of course, since Flux is open source and in the CNCF, it's very community-based. And we designed uh, Weaveworks uh, Weave GitOps to be a little bit more um, opinionated and you know, has certain things abstracted out if you might be the type of user who just says like, I want, I want to take advantage of this really quickly. You know, how can I kind of get stuff abstracted out and just get to GitOps really quickly? Um, and what was really exciting about this event that we just did on October 20th is that we have many other uh, companies in the community that have all uh, chosen Flux and all rely on Flux to deliver GitOps to their enterprise customers. So um, if you want to check it out, you can go to our gitopsdays.com website where you can have early access to the videos and you'll be able to see all these speakers from Amazon, D2IQ, Microsoft, Red Hat, VMware, 
um, all sharing how they uh, use Flux uh, to deliver GitOps to their enterprise users. So you could, if you want to get started with GitOps and you're already on EKS or on AKS, then uh, if you didn't know about it, you could actually go and see those offerings and say, oh, okay, uh, I'll just go there. And I know that they're all trusting Flux and there's a reason for it. And I can click a button that says, give me uh, GitOps. Um, and uh, Weave GitOps is our offering of that as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, all right, a little bit of housekeeping, uh, just a reminder. So um, we'll have our principal engineer uh, giving the talk about um, the uh, intro to Kubernetes and GitOps part. Um, and then David and I, uh, David the PM and I will help walk you through the steps. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll be excited about the vision of GitOps and that you'll be excited to uh, get started with that. So our agenda is now we'll cut to uh, Mark Emice, who will give the uh, introduction. Uh, and then I'll give sort of a, a quick overview of sort of what the cook dinner will look like. And then David will help you go through the steps or the recipe uh, to get you to that vision. Uh, so with that, uh, I will hand it over to Mark. Thanks, Tamil. Get my screen share happening here. All right, hopefully everybody's seeing my slides and I don't have the chat open, so sure. I'll help monitor. There we go, okay. All right, uh, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Tamil mentioned, I'm gonna kind of give a flyby of uh, kind of an introduction into what Kubernetes is uh, and how it relates to GitOps and then how GitOps relates to Kubernetes and how we can uh, take advantage of it and why we think GitOps is uh, so powerful. And then of course, we're gonna segue into uh, a workshop where we actually apply some of these principles. So a little bit of background on me. So uh, I am principal engineer uh, over the Weep GitOps product. Uh, I've been doing software for 30 plus years. Uh, the last five of it has been primarily focused on containers and Kubernetes space. Uh, depending on how long you've been in this, this space, you, remain, you may remember something called Yippie.io, uh, which was a product I was uh, building uh, early on uh, that was a microservice, visual microservice tool for modeling your applications. If you need to reach me, uh, you can reach me on Twitter, uh, GitHub, uh, or of course email mark.emice.weaveworks. And today we're going to be the, using the Weave community Slack. So hopefully everybody has signed up and is there. And if you need to message me directly on that, then it's Mark E on that platform. So what are we going to cover today? So we're going to talk again about a, kind of a brief flyby of what Kubernetes is and how it relates to uh, GitOps and kind of the core competencies there. Uh, and we're going to talk about GitOps itself as well. So, so what is Kubernetes? So uh, Kubernetes is kind of a modern ops stack uh, for the cloud. So uh, I, I, I don't claim to know exactly uh, or who coined that phrase, but it's very accurate. So it's, it's all about running microservice and cloud native applications uh, in a standardized platform. Uh, so containers are really important here, and that standard platform allows you to run both on-prem and in cloud and kind of uh, be able to rely on these services that are available from, from that particular platform that you have there. Uh, it's really based on a, a core set of uh, components or uh, primitives that are inside of Kubernetes. So uh, there's a core API that allows you to interact with all of these. So a couple of them would be uh, namespaces, pods, uh, services, uh, events, secrets, config maps, uh, storage, uh, discovery, networking, RBAC, uh, et cetera. And not only does it have a, uh, many primitives inside of the platform itself, uh, but you can extend the platform using something. Uh, sorry, my <clears throat> voice is cracking. Uh, I did get my booster shot last night. So uh, you can extend Kubernetes itself uh, using something with called cluster resource definitions or CRDs. Uh, and these CRDs, along with a lot of the components that are inside core Kubernetes run with controllers uh, that manage that state inside of Kubernetes itself. Uh, and then operators are something that kind of builds on top of controllers as well, uh, that allows you to manage some of the external entities. So when you think of controllers, uh, I always think those are all internal to Kubernetes and operators allow you to kind of interact with some of the external pieces that you might need outside 
of uh, Kubernetes itself. So uh, briefly on GitOps, uh, why is GitOps important here? Well, uh, you see this list of uh, primitives up there. And of course, when you weigh in the CRDs, now I need something to wrangle all of that complexity uh, in my environment. And so this is where really GitOps falls into the fold and is an important aspect to your Kubernetes environment. Uh, GitOps was born out of the cloud native best practices because uh, it was really born as we were hosting uh, our own internal applications here at GitOps or at Weaveworks. So it's it's fundamentally built with Kubernetes in mind from the base building blocks. Uh, and that's important when you talk about comparing and contrasting with existing solutions that are out uh, in the market today is uh, they a lot of those don't have that solid foundation in the cloud native best practices for Kubernetes. Uh, and we'll talk about why that's important uh, as we continue through this. So uh, as you probably have been given away by the name GitOps, uh, Git is an important portion of it, uh, but it's not strictly Git, right? Really what we're talking about here is we need version controlled immutable storage. Uh, Git for you know source code is a perfect tool for that uh, in order to provide that version control and immutable storage. Hence the term GitOps and how we uh, started with using Git for that aspect. But I just wanted to say that while Git is in the name, it's not necessarily a prerequisite because version control and immutable storage is an important aspect there. And of course, ops is in the name as well. So you need to be able to have continuous delivery, uh, declarative configuration, which we're going to talk more about, and of course, automation, uh, because that's why we're doing this, trying to accelerate the ability to uh, respond to customer needs and wants. So let's talk a little bit more about Kubernetes. So what is Kubernetes? It's an open source platform for operations. Uh, and it's really comprised of a control plane. So the thing that manages Kubernetes itself uh, and the primitives and, and you know how many nodes it's using, uh, memory, et cetera, an API that allows you to interact with that, a data plane that is where your your primarily your workloads will interact with. And then of course there's your workloads there. So when you talk about a Kubernetes, it's kind of this ecosystem, uh, but it is a, a complete platform uh, that you're gonna interact with via the uh, well-defined API in there. So uh, although it is a standard platform, you can have different experiences uh, depending on where you're running Kubernetes. So you can do self-hosted. We're gonna talk about that today with uh, something called Kind, which is Kubernetes in Docker, uh, but you can also use managed Kubernetes as well. And of course, all of the big providers out there today, you have AKS, EKS, GKE, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, and Amazon providing uh, managed Kubernetes services. So primarily what they're giving you is, hey, we're gonna take care of that control plane for you, uh, let you interact with your data plane, and of course, all of the objects in there, and most importantly, your workloads in there. You can also have uh, different Kubernetes environments, you know, sized and the way it shares information and shares uh, components across nodes. Uh, so that would be like a dev test environment. You may configure your Kubernetes environment one way for dev and test and a different way for production and infrastructure. And those are some of the best practices actually that we talk about uh, that we won't talk about here, but we have a bunch of materials on our website that talk about, hey, you know, if you're going to run in dev and test, you'll probably configure it one way. If you're going to run it in production, you want to configure it somewhat differently. So, so you got a whole Kubernetes ecosystem here that's really important uh, for your application development, what you're all here for today. So, again, it's a it's a common platform. Kubernetes does provide conformance testing. So, if you're looking to get a Kubernetes environment provided to you or for you, uh, it's important to ask about the conformance testing. Because if you're running, let's say, Kubernetes 121 in kind, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to move those workloads uh, seamlessly across different environments, maybe to a managed cloud. And that conformance testing is where that'll be important there. So, And the experience is mostly the same across all cloud providers uh, and uh, you know, self-hosted uh, on-premise things, uh, but you'll notice differences around things like networking and storage uh, and different providers are going to provide different helpers in those areas to, to help you with those kind of facilities there. And again, this is where operators would help as well if you're going down that. So uh, I mentioned controllers earlier about those managing the primitives inside of the Kubernetes environment. Uh, there's something called controllers that are reconciling your objects and the desired state. So one thing that Kubernetes is all found its fundamental premise is we want to have a declarative or a or a desired state. So we want you to tell the what 
not the how. And we want Kubernetes, the system itself, to manage that how aspect. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more as to why that's important here. So in order to do that, we need a declarative configuration language. So it happens to be YAML. Uh, everybody, uh, some people love it, some people hate it. Most people are in the middle, really. It's uh, almost a necessary evil of that, but it's really capturing that declarative configuration that you're gonna use to run your workloads inside of Kubernetes. Uh, itself. So in, for example, you know, you have a declarative configuration defines like a deployment. So let's say you're running uh, a message queue, you're going to define, you know, how big that message queue is, how much memory you want to provide to that, how many instances of that you want, but you don't want to manage having to set up and deal all of that there by yourself. Uh, you want to let the platform do it. And that's where Kubernetes really excels. So you're going to define what you're expecting for your deployment and let Kubernetes manage that for you. And again, controllers are driving this. So what are they driving? They're saying, uh, you've, you've defined the, the desired state that you want. We're going to drive the actual state to match that. So what do I mean by that? So let's take an example here. So uh, with Kubernetes, you can do imperative uh, operations versus declarative things. So the example I have here is I'm just going to run an image. So an image is a container inside my Kubernetes environment. So I'm going to do kubectl run image. And what is that going to do? It's going to generate a pod. Uh, a pod is Kubernetes base building block. A, a pod is comprised of one or more containers inside of it. So what this command does is it tells Kubernetes, basically, I'm going to manage uh, that I want one instance of this container running. It's going to wrap it in a pod and it's going to run it on the system. Kubernetes is still going to drive that pod to get it to running. So it's going to fetch the image. It's going to uh, start the image and make sure it's running based on how you've defined that container. And then it's kind of going to be hands off at that point. Now, it'll handle restarts if it fails, but it's not going to do much else for you. So by this definition and the way I'm using it here, this is more of an imperative call and not declarative, right? So if you were managing, let's say 15 or 20 things and you wanted to manage them this way, you'd be a busy person trying to keep all of that stuff running in your environment, scaling, dealing with failures, et cetera, right? So that's kind of a bad example here. A better example would be defining a deployment. So I could take the same object, define it, the same image that I want to run and define it in something called a deployment and specify I want number of replicas. So before I'm running kubectl run the number of times that I want to have instances running. This example, I'm saying, no, I'm going to give you a template specification. And what I want is, five, let's say, for example, five of these that look like this. Kubernetes is then going to spring into action with a controller, right? And uh, get the system running up to match that template definition. So what it's gonna do is create an, immu an immutable object that is based on the template and get drive all of those pods to be running. So now what you've seen that we just did is I defined a YAML file that defined my image in there. And I just asked Kubernetes, hey, I applied it to my Kubernetes environment. So you can kind of look at the verb because it kind of indicates a little bit of difference there. One verb, I'm doing a run, so I'm telling it in parallel to do something. And the other one, I'm just kind of giving it a, 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 a spec, if you will, to say, go off and please make this happen. And that's via the apply uh, verb there. So this, of course, applies to all Kubernetes objects. So I can create a job. So a job is something, a container that runs to completion. And I can specify you know, as many number of those as I want. I could do a cron job. So this would be something that I define the schedule and the container I want to run. Kubernetes then handles all the rest of that based on a, on a triggered object. So I mentioned a deployment earlier and saying I need a number of replicas. You could also have a deployment that specifies a stateful set, so a, a fixed number of objects that you need running. Uh, for instance, like a database to have quorum, you want, you know, n number of writers in your system, you define that and Kubernetes will manage that for you. So something you're going to hear me mention quite a bit, control loops is kind of how I think about it in that, you know, you're doing a declared state, you have an actual state and you have something that's driving that uh, to make sure we get the desired, the actual state up to match the desired state. So Kind of as a recap on that, in Kubernetes, you're going to declare your desired state. You're going to apply that to your Kubernetes environment. Kubernetes is then going to spring in and try and drive the system to match the desired state that you want there with control loops. So these three steps kind of, kind of really high level, but that gives you a feel for what that environment's giving you. Um, and now let's talk a little bit about, well, where does GitOps fit into that? So what would it look like if that desired state that we just talked about 
was a single uh, artifact that you could know, hey, so back to where I was talking before, uh, it doesn't have to be Git, but it needs to be version controlled and it needs to be immutable. So if I have a single artifact, Git, I can point to it and that is an immutable artifact that doesn't change over time, right? So that's a really important concept there because it's going to drive some of the values that you're going to get from GitOps as we move forward. So it turns out that can be a Git commit, right? That is that single artifact. So with Kubernetes YAML in it, it's just a Git commit that we could reference. But as I started to allude to, GitOps is really more than that. Uh, it's really a set of principles that uh, if you're running GitOps that you want to follow uh, that define, hey, this is what it means to be GitOps. So uh, this is a picture of the, the website uh, opengitops.dev, which is a group of companies got together. Uh, WeaveWorks being one of them, Red Hat's included, CodeFresh is there as well. Uh, and they kind of defined, okay, what are the four, what are the common principles that we recognize a GitOps environment to have? So one, it has to be declarative. So uh, I want you to define the what, and we want the system to manage the how, right, getting to it. Uh, if I have declarative manifests, I really need those to be immutable and version so that I can move forward, right? Uh, move forward in time and backward in time uh, and know that if I need to repeat something, it's immutable, I'm using an object that doesn't change. So I'm gonna have declarative objects that are version and immutable. Now my system itself needs to pull the, all of those changes automatically into it, right? So uh, we have something that's watching that and pulling version and immutable declarative objects into the system and then managing them. And then we need something that's continuously reconciling. So we know we're automatically pulling these artifacts in that are gonna have a desired state in it. We need something working to achieve that actual state up to the desired state. So this is not just a starting. So it's not just, I wanna drive from uh, point A to B, I wanna stay at point B. So if, if something happens to your system, you have failures, your replicas drop off, uh, then you know something is working on your behalf to continuously reconcile and keep to that state. So how do these principles of GitOps uh, benefit businesses? So uh, these are gonna give us uh, greater visibility into what's happening into our system because now we have a common framework uh, that you can move between projects, uh, move between different environments that give you that visibility into what's happening in the system. Uh, improved security, which is a big one in that uh, if you take a traditional like continuous delivery system, it's gonna need keys in order to talk to all of your different environments. Uh, you, you may have seen this already. And whereas we flipped that a little bit with GitOps in that we're gonna let the thing do a poll. So it's the thing that needs the keys that talks back. So now I can manage that. And I don't have a single uh, place that has all of the keys that I need to worry about. We can spread those out. And that gives us, uh, uh, moves that permission model around a little bit. And now I can control via an access log who's actually accessing it and control it at that level. So because of those switches in there, I can get easier compliance. I have auditability and I have standardization. If we talk about benefits for developers, uh, they can do easier deploy. So instead of learning uh, the entire uh, interface into a Kubernetes system, uh, you have that set up for it to automatically pull changes that they commit to make uh, to an application into the cluster itself. So one of the things that's nice here is you don't have to worry about, hey, or keep track of where did I give out these credentials in order for somebody to talk to my clusters, uh, because you know you didn't give them out, right? It's a pull-based model and you're using GitOps. One thing that's really interesting here, and this is that last bullet item, is I ran a command that left things in an irreversible state. So I don't know about you, but uh, Sometimes when I'm troubleshooting something that has happened in my environment, let's say uh, something's going on with my system, you know, I'm in a bash shell and I'm making changes to the system uh, and running different commands to try and figure out, I don't know, like uh, why I can't talk to uh, GitHub yesterday um, because they changed their key format. But anyway, so I'm troubleshooting that action, uh, which is really nice because I have a record or an audit of the changes I made. I just run my bash history, right? That should be enough. Uh, but it turns out it's not because when I go look there, what did I see uh, yesterday in particular? I saw a VI known host file, right? So I was in there mucking around my known host file, but I don't know what I changed. So if I broke something else, 
I'm now lost here. So this is where GitOps and using Git as your foundation there and the auditability and traceability and the fact that I committed something to Git and then applied it to the cluster is really important because I can go back and look and see what I might have broken there. So that's just kind of a, an example of something that I, I you know, have run into personally on myself over, over the years. So how does this also benefit platforms teams? So it's very similar to the business and the teams. Uh, but you have less code to maintain, right? So uh, each environment probably comes with a set of custom scripts uh, and everything to get things set up. Whereas GitOps, you're using a standardized mechanism. You're using the standard platform, Kubernetes. Uh, you should have a standardized cloud native way to get uh, applications and workloads deployed into that environment. So this really helps you in reducing the code there. Again, we're gonna talk about the permission thing. We sound like a broken record, but uh, you don't have to have that you know, one you know, CI system that you give all the keys to uh, and, and trust it to do the right thing. Uh, mentioned easier rollback. So, you know, you can revert changes and get fairly straightforwardly. Of course, we're glossing over uh, if your workload and your cloud native application has a database, it'll have to be able to deal with that. But there's, but by being able to revert changes in Git and have a record of it and then have those automatically applied allows you to easier more easily react to changes and to troubleshoot environments uh, and have a record of that entire troubleshooting. So again, easier track changes and it provides that layer of standardization for delivery. So now you know, hey, I'm using a Kubernetes standard platform. I know how all workloads get deployed. They get deployed via GitOps and they have a standardized mechanism to do that. So summary, uh, this, these three items look similar to the three items we had for Kubernetes. So I have declarative configurations. Uh, they're version controlled and immutable artifacts. I have a single source of truth, which is Git, right? But we're adding on top of it automated delivery. So remember, we talked about the principles. We need something automatically pulling those changes. But of course, we're changing. We're pulling in declarative resources into the system, uh, not imperative commands. Uh, we have agents running in the cluster that are doing the constant reconciliation of the desired state to the actual state, and then. This is all a closed loop. So we know that we are continually uh, uh, reconciling to make sure uh, desired state stays in the cluster. So bring it to desired state and make sure we maintain that desired state in our system. So just a, a quick picture of that. So if you take a look, we have a developer checking in a declarative manifest, a YAML file into Git, it's version controlled. We have agents that are doing the automated delivery to Kubernetes uh, with those software agents. And then we have this closed loop. So the reconciliation and all of the automatic delivery is happening inside the Kubernetes environment. So let's contrast that with a traditional system. Traditional system you'd have like Kubernetes with the API server here. Um, you'd have developers. Developers are doing what developers do, checking in code. You're gonna have a CI system that then is responsible for building that code and deploying that code. Uh, and then you're going to iterate over that to get that into the registry. But now you need to apply that to the cluster. So you're going to have a uh, kubectl process. It's going to need a key. So this is where we talked about GitOps switches it from a push to a pull model. And I'm going to need that key in order to talk to the API server. And then, of course, Kubernetes needs to talk back to your registry to pull those images back in. So in summary, uh, you know, GitOps is a Git-centric way of implementing uh, continuous delivery. So uh, the benefits increase productivity, enhance developer experience, improve stability, higher reliability, consistency, and standardization, stronger security guarantees. We talked about the four principles. Again, these are uh, principles we follow, but they're also principles that were created as a, with a, several companies together. And again, declarative, version controlled and immutable, automatically pulled into the system and continuously reconciled. So GitOps is helping to break that tight coupling of CI, CD, and we're using that with GitOps. That's it. Hopefully I didn't uh, didn't go too fast, but uh, I know sometimes I can't go too fast. So questions? Awesome. Yes. Does anybody have questions for Mark on the overview of, uh, in fact, Maybe you can also raise your hand if anybody here is just looking into Kubernetes and is uh, looking to see it as a, a potential uh, direction to go. It'd be good to know um, how many people you know are, are brand new and uh, how many are. Okay, got one hand. 
a couple more. Uh, we'll see. Excellent. So let us know feedback. We'll follow up with you. We'd love to hear. This is our first time kind of doing this. Uh, well, I think it's the second time, but this we've been developing this. So, you know, especially for people who are brand new, we'd love to hear like, is this a helpful intro, especially of Kubernetes in the context of uh, GitOps? Because obviously, if we did a full intro to Kubernetes, it would be a multi-day thing. So we're like hoping to, um, you know, give context uh, for people who find that useful. So yes, and sorry, my cat is yelling. <laughs> so um, yes, if you if any questions come up later, don't feel shy to ask. We can uh, ask. Uh, Mark, Mark will be here so we can cover those and even while we're doing the workshop, especially if there might be times that we're, we're pausing to wait, we can definitely answer more questions as they might come to you. Uh, excellent. So with that, let me, uh, sorry, I'm trying to look at the chat here. I will now share my slides and hopefully this will work this time. I'm trying to work out this. Oh, okay. Let's see how this works. <laughs> Zoom shares. All right. Can everybody see full slides? Not my yep. presentation view. Okay. And then if I advance it, is it advancing? Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> Just wanted to double check. Um, okay. So here we uh, now move on to the hands on portion of our workshop. Again, reminder please have your laptops ready. Uh, we will go through some prerequisites. It's okay. Some people might have so, not have some basic things installed. Um, we've got plenty of time to make sure that everybody can make it through. We uh, would prefer to make sure that we're providing you this full service experience versus, um, you know, having you kind of just go, oh, I'll just, I'll just come back to the video later and finish up on my own. Um, you know, most people have been able to finish. Um, only a few, like maybe just, just stragglers, uh, we wrapped up on Slack afterwards, but um, otherwise we've had people be very successful. So we really hope that you'll be successful as well. It's great to see so many people here. Um, so now I'll do an overview that uh, kind of uh, overlaps a little bit with what uh, Mark shared, but hopefully gives it within the context of, you know, what we feel is um, a good beginner way to GitOps. Uh, that's why we designed Weave GitOps, because uh, there are many paths and, you know, this can be one way that you can kind of quickly get to GitOps and then you can kind of decide uh, where you go from there. So let us know what you think. So uh, I mentioned if you joined later, uh, we are from a company called Weaveworks. I gave an intro at the beginning. In this context, I'll share how we as a company are very committed to transitioning people to cloud native. Um, we have been using Kubernetes in production for now, I don't know, six years. Uh, so you know, we hope that uh, if you're new on your Kubernetes journey, we're happy to help you with that as well. We are definitely obsessed with delivering the value that um, Mark was sort of talking about in terms of using Kubernetes, in terms of um, getting started with GitOps. And um, important thing is that, you know, it's no matter what flavor of Kubernetes you're using. Uh, so on-prem, in the cloud, we've been working with all the different um, partners and cloud vendors. And so we've had various solutions for GitOps for you, and we want to make sure that you're successful. Uh, we did not just coin the term GitOps, but we are definitely leaders in the space. Uh, and I think our most recent sort of testimonials and talks really uh, justify that and, and give bolstering to that. Um, so Mark touched on this, but I'll reiterate just the importance of velocity. Um, if you've looked at Dora metrics, I mean, there's just a lot of proof out there that anything that helps with your velocity helps with your business. And that's what we're uh, committed to. And that's why we designed Weave GitOps. Um, any level, right, where you're uh, reducing a number of fla failed deploys, your operational incidents, um, definitely with GitOps, you're able to troubleshoot and roll back if you have um, any issues, of course, lowering the mean time to recovery is very, very important. Um, deployment frequency is the key metric for velocity, right? Um, as well as being able to have a reliable system. I think that's what's been um, one of the most uh, valuable feedback that we've received. It's just the reliability of Flux, the open source project, and now we've GitOps, the product built on it. It's like they um, just are very glad, you know, happy with the way we've designed um, the projects and the technology. So the reliability that they're able to gain from it um, on a production level is uh, really rewarding to hear that feedback. 
So with our goals, um, we designed Weave GitOps to be both Kubernetes native and Flux native. Uh, so it's very streamlined and you get all the benefits of as what Mark just covered, the GitOps qualities of Kubernetes as well as uh, Flux, but hopefully in a way that makes it very e easy for you to get started. Um, as I mentioned in the opening, we just did this GitOps one-stop shop event on October 20th. And so it was really gratifying to see, you know, Amazon, D2IQ, Microsoft, Red Hat, VMware, all coming and saying, you know, Flux is, uh, there's a reason it's in the CNCF and getting close to graduation. It is a really, really robust product and really well designed. So they've all trusted uh, building their GitOps offerings using Flux uh, as we have too with Weave GitOps. So we hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll um, be able to see the benefits of that. Um, and the core part of saying that it's Flux native is that anything that you can do with Flux, um, you can do through Weave GitOps, and that's how we've been designing it. So you can take advantage of all the features out of the box. Um, and ideally, um, we would be having customers, and we're already having already, who it's not just that you use one or the other. You may have different clusters where some use Flux, some use Weave GitOps, um, some maybe use Microsoft's uh, Arc Kubernetes. And so depending on what team is leveraging those clusters, what their needs are, their knowledge level, um, what their onboarding is needed, there's all these different ways that you can leverage all the technologies. It's not just one choice. Um, and it's critical to mention here that it's both for apps teams and cluster ops teams. You know, this GitOps is made across the board to benefit everybody uh, and their end customers. So um, it's designed to be a total product to deploy, deploy, connect to CI workflows, give you observ observability, et cetera. So uh, we're really excited to offer Weave GitOps. Um, which has a free and open source component, which is Weave GitOps core. Um, and then you can upgrade to enterprise when you need the enterprise features. So today we'll be looking at the open source free version of Weave GitOps core. Uh, we've talked about um, the GitOps maturity model. So many of you can kind of start thinking about where you want to be and hopefully this will get you excited. Um, if you're today at zero, you're doing, you know, GitOpsing a simple app to getting to the top of the pyramid where you're adding policy, doing multi-tenancy, doing complex management of larger GitOps deployments. Um, for us, we are very dedicated to making sure that we help you on your journey. Uh, if you've come to any of our GitOps Days events, you'll see all the speakers who are practitioners at various levels. It's a constant journey. You're always uh, being able to leverage GitOps in more and more ways. And so we are committed to helping you get there. Uh, again, velocity, that is the core of the business um, advantages and the core of way, the way we think about this uh, product. And so we want to make sure that using this, you'll be able to take advantage of all the core GitOps um, capabilities that are um, important to accelerating your software lifecycle, resilience, automation, continuous app delivery, and a decreased mean time to recovery. Um, so with that, like I said, we will go through uh, the free and open source version of Weave GitOps and we'll get started right away. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to join along. Like I said, get your laptops ready and we will go through this. So thank you. With that, I will hand it over to David. Hello, David. Hello. Hey. Thank you for that wonderful intro. Uh, I will start sharing my screen. Then we can get going. Right. Hopefully that's my screen visible. Um, someone give me a shout if not. Uh, hopefully it will be relatively readable, but a uh, link has been provided in the chat so you can follow along as well. Um, so what we are going to do today is we are going to start completely from scratch with nothing on our local system. We're gonna create a local Kubernetes cluster using Kind. So Kind requires Docker. So you'll need to have Docker installed. I think Kind has some experimental support for Podman at the moment as well, if you're looking at alternatives. Uh, we'll then install the GitOps CLI. For this, we provide a Mac OS and a Linux binary. So it should also work with the Windows subsystem for Linux and a native Windows build is in the works. There's an issue on the uh, installation page. If you want the racial support for that, that'd be great. Um, we will 
basically install the GitOps runtime. Uh, so this heavily leverages Flux and the GitOps toolkit, which Flux is built on. Um, we will reconcile a simple application called PodInfo, uh, which is comprised of a backend, a front end, uh, and it includes a namespace for our deployment. We will then make some changes to the app, both ones which are permitted and ones which are not. And we will see the GitOps reconciliation process take care of that for us. So as Tamara was saying at the start, we will go slowly with this. If you get stuck, raise your hand, chat to us, um, and we will help you through it. There is no rush, we have plenty of time. So start with on our prerequisites for this guide, we will be um, copying from a GitHub repo. So you will need a GitHub account. You will need kubectl installed. This helps if you want to see what's actually deployed on your cluster. And we also do some port forwarding so you can access the running application. Uh, and the Kubernetes cluster that we are going to use is kind, but you can bring your own. Uh, it'd be great to hear what you're using in the chat as well. So first things first. Um, yes. if you... Well, prerequisite first, I posted in the chat, just making sure uh, who needs, how many people need to install Docker? How many people need to create a GitHub account? And then we have two more steps in the prerequisites. Don't be shy. We're gonna have plenty of time. There is no rush. Yes, we've done this. Uh, okay, we've got one person who's Kubernetes ready. Kubernetes ready already. Oh. It's ready. <laughs> All right. Get <GitHub's> ready. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, it's funny. All right. Some people are sharing their links. Thank you. I'm afraid, as you can see from my terminal window in the top left, I've just tanked my Kubernetes cluster. So you'll have to wait for mine to start. Ah, okay. So, um, all right. So we certainly want to take the time. Um, like I said, don't feel shy. We've had plenty of people who had to install these, had to create a GitHub account. Um, and then, yes, you will also mention how many people to install kubectl. Um, and then definitely the kind part is one where it's not surprising if people don't have it and um, it's a pretty quick install. So that's probably one of the less. Where's the link to the repo? Which repo? Yes, which do you mean? Uh, getting ahead of ourselves, are we? Oh, you mean the sample app? <laughs> the sample app is further down in step three. Yes, that's um, the point. Yes, kind is a quick install. Um, actually, and I, I don't know how how long is the Docker install? Is that a, does that take a while if someone has to? It's been a long time since I've install Docker on a fresh system. Yes. Oh, nice. Thank you, Alex. Curl get docker.com. Excellent. It's great to see all the chats. Yeah, Christian, it'd be interesting to know what you mean when the Flux version doesn't exist, but GitOps version does. Um, where exactly you're seeing that, that'd be great. And uh, actually a good question. Uh, I know we've been in conversations about people who are already using Flux. Is it currently such that it's still going to ask you to uninstall Flux or how we resolve that? No, so currently there is a limitation that you cannot have Flux installed on the, on the same cluster that is, should be resolved in either the next release or the one after that, where we will yeah. be looking at a way to adopt an existing Flux cluster. Yes, I saw that PR. Okay, so let's check in again on these prerequisites. Um, Docker installed, and then um, 
sorry, I was blanking. Oh yeah, starting a GitHub account, installing kubectl, uh, and then the final one is uh, to install kind. And uh, is anybody here feeling completely overwhelmed already and feels, okay, we have someone on Rancher. I forget, does this work for people using Rancher? Yep, it'll work. Okay. Yes, that would be uh, aligned with the statements we made during our talks, which is it'll work with every flavor of Kubernetes. Yes, who cannot proceed to our first installation steps? It's like I said, we've got plenty of time. And so the whole goal is not to leave people behind. We are happy to help. We've got staff on board to answer your questions. Going once, going twice. What am I buying? <laughs> <laughs> A um, wonderful about, GitOps solution. Uh, so what about you, David? Are you still waiting on your? Um, well, the first step is to install the CLI and I have cheated and already done that okay. because my download speed can be a little slow. Yes, the cooking show as always. Um, all righty, we're going to, sorry. So from the getting started page, uh, you can copy the block of commands to install the GitOps CLI. Uh, this will download either the Mac or the Linux version, depending on your OS, uh, shift it into your path, and then it will output GitOps version to show that it is successfully installed. I will just do that to show you what it looks like. Uh, good to see it's also working on K3S. <laughs> so this is the latest version of Weave GitOps 0.4.1. It bundles Flux version uh, 0.2.1, or 0.21, I should say. Uh, for those that recently saw the CNCF audit, I thought that was absolutely fantastic how the Flux team handled that. Uh, it was great to see them address the external security concerns and get those fixed. Um, as you can see, we are currently running on a fixed version of Weave GitOps because that was released in 0.18. I think most of those or the one CVE that was found uh, was addressed. Um, but kudos to the Flux team as I feel they did a really good job there in the open. So once you have your, well, could it, Anyone let us know if they are still waiting to download the CLI. Otherwise, we will start moving on to the creation of a Kubernetes cluster. It's true. Download times, you never know. Um, back to how, you know, how large the file is. Is it a fairly lightweight file? I think it's relatively light. I think it's maybe 100 megs tops. I believe it's about 100 megabyte. Nice, nice. Okay. Uh, let us know if you are still waiting to download or if you are stuck in any other parts of our prerequisite steps. We've also had that too, where we're good um, 25 minutes in and I was very thankful that someone was willing to raise their hand and say, actually, I'm about three steps back and we have no problem yeah. with that too. <laughs> Not at all. Um, all right. Well, hopefully people have had success with that. Seems to work. Start my okay. cluster. So as I say, we're using kind. Uh, the command to start kind cluster is just kind create cluster. Uh, and this verb noun structure that kind and to the majority kubectl uh, uses, we are trying to move to and adopt within weave GitOps. We used to have a noun verb structure. Um, but this will actually be the first workshop that we've done showcasing the new verb now. So let's see if my muscle memory causes some hiccups. There we go, it's mine running. So whilst we're waiting on folks and for those that are already uh, up and running, I will show you what I mean by the verb noun. Yeah, it's cool that we have uh, Theo using Catacoda for this, our good, our good friends at Catacoda. 
So if you want to add components, you do an add, and the type of components, if you want to delete them, you do a delete. Uh, we previously used to have a structure where it was like GitOps application add. Um, so this we think is a little bit more intuitive, but we'd love any and all feedback on this and like how you get on using the CLI as well as the web UI that we'll be demonstrating in this, um, in this session. As, uh, as Tamar mentioned, we're a fully open source project built on top of Flux. Uh, you can chat to us in Slack. You can raise issues on GitHub. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So anyone waiting on a Kubernetes cluster? And reminder that uh, if you are already using Flux, then at least for this iteration, um, it will prompt you to uh, uninstall. But before the end of this year, it will work. Thanks for sharing the links. Yes, we've got a specific uh, channel for GitOps, so definitely uh, check in there. Let us know how things are going. Um, we've had people come to these and then ask for uh, um, a demo for their team. So we're happy to do that as well. Yep. And I'll remind, this is free and open source. So you can have anybody try it and go through these steps at any time. Indeed. So not seeing any hands raised on still waiting on Kubernetes. Uh, and, again, please don't be shy. Yes. Uh, I'm just going to kick off the GitOps install, but yes. we'll wait. So don't do not worry. Yes. You can to install, we've GitOps. Very simple. GitOps install. This will install the GitOps toolkit leveraged by Flux uh, into the Weave GitOps. Uh, we've no, no, no. Into the WeGo namespace or WeGo system namespace, it will create a bunch of CRDs that we use and it will add some Weave GitOps core components as well. This will take mm, maybe a couple of minutes depending on system. So that was why I was keen to, to kick it off just to make sure that we're moving forward. Yeah. And to clarify the terminology, so Flux is a microservices architecture project. And so um, sort of one of the base components uh, has been called the GitOps toolkit uh, because it is a toolkit upon which uh, you or uh, other companies have built um, other capabilities. So our Flux project is built on um, the GitOps toolkit, but it's something that uh, you can use for other things if you're exploring your needs. Uh, but it's all under the Flux uh, project, fluxcd.io. And if you go to our GitHub uh, page, you'll find all the bits. Yeah, and it's a fantastic point for, for talking about the extensibility that that provides and seeing how many different solutions we've seen built on top of it is, is fantastic. Yes. Um, and yes, Sherry, it's a microservices uh, architecture that exactly is extensible. And uh, at some point, yeah, we're starting to see people build stuff and uh, my developer experience team will look into, you know, what that ecosystem may be in the future. So it's exciting. Yep. And uh, that's one of the pieces of feedback that we received um, when I mentioned how um, Microsoft, VMware, Red Hat, um, Amazon, D2IQ, you know, we're all using um, uh, Flux. Uh, a lot of it was components of the GitOps toolkit. They said, well, we chose this because we're like, why did you choose us? They said, well, we chose, we chose you because of exactly that extensibility. Um, and then the microservices architecture means that we've got um, a, a range of controllers um, that do various parts of the work. And so they could find particular controllers to you know, contribute to and to um, leverage. And so it's great to get that feedback that uh, the you know, design of Flux has really been paying off to provide uh, helpful tools <laughs> for not just direct, direct users, but um, you know, cloud providers and others in the ecosystem. So very uh, exciting and validating. Definitely. Uh, so I'll give a couple of more seconds for folks. I'll show you what's actually got installed. Uh, So 
there you can see the components which make up the GitOps toolkit, the various controllers uh, which Mark referenced as ensuring actual state and desired state are aligned. And David, not to put you on the spot, but sometimes we've talked about with the flux bootstrapping about how from literally day zero, you're already doing GitOps, especially if you're brand new to it. Is, uh, is that the case for we GitOps as well? And so with when you do an ad app, which is what we'll basically be showing in this demo, what we will be doing is writing the automation objects to Git repository and then flux will be reconciling uh, what we're telling it to pull down to the cluster. At the moment, so in the current release, we don't store the, uh, the GitOps runtime, so like Flux itself uh, in a Git repository that is changing in the next release. Um, so whilst Bootstrap will basically take a Git repository and it will set up a system folder, we try and go a little step further. So we put down a more opinionated directory structure, which enables you to easily see how you manage multiple applications across multiple clusters, multiple environments, all from the same GitOps repo. Uh, and that gets bootstrapped for you through the install command. You just need to provide which repo we are going to write into. So that's a very exciting change that's coming up in the next release. Yeah, and hopefully that'll be helpful for people because I feel like um, with Flux, um, that is one of our most common questions. Like, you know, how should I, uh, organize my directory structure. And um, there are so many ways that existing users are doing it in production that we mm -hmm. try to give some pointers, but there isn't like one single way to do it. Um, and hence with Weave GitOps, right? We've, we have people like David who take in all the information, you know, look, look at the landscape, look at what people are doing. And so we provide in product, you know, a very opinionated way to, to start. And then from there, like we said, you know, you can give feedback, you can uh, take on different practices, you can decide if the cluster maybe is more appropriate for doing something with Flux, if there's something different. Um, we're making it so that hopefully it's, it's not an on off switch, but it's as close as an on off switch as we can make it so that, you know, people can very elegantly move between Flux and we've GitOps and we've GitOps and Flux uh, on those particular clusters. Um, but when you are yeah. looking for getting started and want that opinion, I think that's what's uh, we've GitOps, uh, the value that it brings. Exactly. I think um, Alexis, our, our founder, likes to make the analogy with Spring Boot. So we're trying to say, like, we provide you an easy way to get um, up and running, but you can always drop down into the layer when you need to break from our uh, prescribed path. And we do not restrict you from doing that. Strong opinions loosely held is the idea. All right, I hope everybody's doing all right. Um, Christian's uh, ahead of us, so we got to catch up to Christian. <laughs> so uh, yeah, next. So next thing we're going to do is to fork the repo. So it's very important that you fork this repo. You don't try and use this one directly because we are going to be writing to the repo. And if you don't have access to do so, it won't work. Uh, so go to the pod info deploy repository that's linked in the guide, click fork, I already have one. Um, as I say, the application is fairly straightforward. Uh, it has a back end and a front end. These are the, the glorious YAML files as Mark described. So we have the deployment, uh, we have a service which exposes the URL for it so you can access the application and a horizontal pod autoscaler just to take care of your uh, the pod scaling based on demand. Excellent. I was just chatting with a friend who has young children and was talking about leaving his kids YAML files of observations. <laughs> and we, we said, uh, by the time your kids are old enough, like I probably won't be able to read YAML files. Who knows what it'll be in 20 years. Indeed. Uh, Shout out to Stefan Prodan, who uh, I mentioned is one of our um, Flux maintainers and the creator of Flagger, as well as creator of this very, very popular sample app, PodInfo. Uh, we, we joke about how uh, um, we, we count how many talks we see at KubeCon where uh, people we don't even know, they're using PodInfo as their sample app. So, worked out nicely. 
It is fantastic. Uh, not seeing anyone getting stuck, so I'm just going to start the GitOps dashboard, which is our web UI. So to do that, the command is GitOps UI run. Mine is already started. I should have killed that before. Apologies. Let's do a... There you are. Better. So you'll be presented with uh, an empty view of all of your applications. Uh, we're going to add that pod info application so that it is managed by Weave GitOps. This means it will start to be continuously reconciled onto the cluster. So to do that, uh, once you've got the UI running, you can click this add application button. I'm going to pull this into a different tab. So I have two things running. I'll make it a bit bigger. So to add the pod info application, we have to give it a name. You can copy and paste all the values from the getting started guide to make this nice and simple. You will have to change your user ID in the Git URL structure. That's about it. So we give our application a name. We say where we want to store the automation object. So this isn't where your application is deployed. We are improving the help text for this because we find it could be a bit confusing. But this is where the automation objects, so the things that Flux is using to deploy your applications, where they will get installed on Kubernetes. So the example application that we're using includes a namespace of test, and it will deploy into that namespace. It won't deploy the application into the Wego system namespace. Uh, you then need to provide the URL, your Git repo. For me, it's quite handy because it is exactly the one used in the example. Uh, now the config <laughs> <laughs> privileges of writing the guide. Um, so the config repo URL. Now this is actually something that we recommend you do. So this is to have an external GitOps repo which would manage all of your applications. But um, we found that particularly when people just want to get started, um, having to have two repos is a bit of a overhead, particularly if you're working in organizations where you're not allowed to create new repos. So you can add the automation uh, objects in Git to the same source repo as your application where your, your manifests are. And that's what we'll do uh, in this demo. Uh, but as I say, we would typically recommend that you would set an external uh, repo for GitOps. And this is where you'll, you'll be adding all of your automation objects. Uh, you then need to provide a path. So within your directory or within your repo, I should say, where you want uh, Flux to look for manifests. Uh, this can be root, uh, particularly in this example, but this does allow you to sort of have a more tailored approach. So if you're using customized overlays, then this allows you to point to exactly where you need to, uh, to set up this particular reconciliation. And shouldn't need to change the branch if uh, you automatically fork and it goes to master. That would be very strange, but if you do that, then you might have to change it. And when you're ready, click Submit. And because I haven't done this in a while, what we're first going to do is we're going to authenticate with GitHub. So this is verifying who you are and that you are allowed to write to that repo. So you click Authorize GitHub Access. You get granted a code. This is very similar to if you use the GitHub CLI. It's basically the same workflow. Paste it in, click continue. It's basically asking for repository scope. So if you go through the CLI, you can use a personal access token as well, and that avoids having to do this authorization. I then need to remember my password.
go back to the dashboard. We'll see a little spinny. And then we see that the application has been added successfully. So because this is GitOps, what we have done is we've raised a pull request. So this means that you can enforce kind of that peer review and good audibility of any changes that you're wanting to make to that cluster. Uh, I can see the outline of an error in chat. Is that something I should have a look at or is someone else handling? Um, I don't think Mark has gotten to it yet, but David, so thanks for... GitHub changed their keys. Ah, that's the... Oh, this. <laughs> yeah, this, this hit me as well. Yeah. Speaking of uh, Stefan, Stefan discovered that that was causing problems at 9 p.m. Romania time and was up quite late until it got fixed. So this this is exactly what I did to fix it, but your mileage may vary. But yeah, this was, this was an annoying one. <laughs> this is GitHub changing it. So as I say, we, we raise a pull request. Um, so if you click the link to open uh, active pull requests, you can see this new one that's been added. You can see that's been added by me. So you get a good audit trail on who's trying to do what. If we look into the pull request itself, uh, we're adding three files. So these are things that will be deployed onto the cluster. We have our top level application. So this is how we can query status um, on your deployment. We have a customization and a Git repository. I think if I scroll down in here, I tried to describe exactly what these would do, um, but basically the Git repository is setting up the, the watch on Git. So you see how often do you want to check uh, your Git repository for new updates. Customization is uh, applying those updates. So if there is a if there is a drift in your live state compared to the desired state in Git, this will override it and we'll see that uh, in action shortly. Uh, the fact that it's a PR, as I say, gives you a chance to review it, make changes. If you're happy with it, click merge, delete the branch, it's not required. And then you can see this has added a .wego folder uh, to our source. If I go to a terminal, so it's only once the PR has been merged that Flux will start to, to reconcile. So if I make this a wee bit bigger, okay, get to pods, namespace, test. There we go, it was quick. We can see that the, the pods have come up for our application. I go back into our web UI, go back to the applications page. We now see we have the pod info deploy application. Uh, within the UI, apologies, it's a bit big. Uh, we have a reconciliation graph. So this will show you everything related to that application deployment. You can see it has a test uh, namespace, a couple of services for the back end and front end. The deployment, which um, as Mark was saying, was kind of like how you declaratively say what you want uh, to be running. That triggers a replica set, that triggers a pod, which is where your containers actually end up. Uh, we have our horizontal pod auto scaler to control uh, how it scales, funnily enough. It's the font size, I would be delighted. Well, this is the problem when you're trying to do a screen share and you have a slightly big screen. Uh, so underneath the reconciliation, you get a couple of uh, automation conditions. This really helps you understand exactly what's going on in the state of your deployment. So the source condition, as I mentioned, this is telling us that um, we fetched a particular revision from Git. So you can see exactly which change we last detected. Um, the automation is saying which one has been applied to the cluster. Then underneath this, we provide the list of the 10 most recent commits to your application repo. So this makes it even easier to understand because you can easily tie it to the message from the commit. So you can see 1E69333, 
that relates to merging of the pull requests. So I know that this is actually getting my application deployed. Seeing another error. Oh, same one. Um, Yep, so this will be a, a git of issue again. I wish they didn't do this like the day before the workshop. You mean GitHub? Yeah. <laughs> tell I them. mean, I'm glad they did the change, but they could have waited a day. <laughs> so is this the same uh, fix that you showed earlier? Or? Yes, it should be. the SSH key gen. Yeah. yeah, I think the GitHub change happened. It was a few days back. Three days ago. Yeah. I just uh, take this moment to check with everybody. Thanks for all the fantastic questions. Anybody, like I said, no shame. Anybody like, I'm still install installing WKS Cuddle, <laughs> or sorry, Cube, Cube Cuddle, or uh, got stuck with Kine, or bad internet connection and still waiting for the uh, weave GitOps to install. And it looks like uh, when you were filling out that form, you kind of have a screen capture of it in the docs as well, right? So they can kind of follow along with that. So uh, I'm actually gonna update the screen capture because it currently shows it empty. I think it would probably be easier if it showed everything. Oh, I guess it does empty? afterwards. Yeah. Um, you kind of get it afterwards, but I think people read <laughs> in order. So I'll update the screenshot to show the values. But as I say, the values that you need to copy in uh, provided just below the screenshot. Great. Right. Looks like there, if you can do more zoom, David, that'd be useful. Not sure which, which window. I was just going to ask, what, what, what would you like to see, Sherry? I'm happy to zoom in. I just want to make sure I zoom in on the right bit. <laughs> Sharon might be like me. I've got my 13 inch laptop. Let's we can do that. Right. So, too big. That will hopefully do. Um, so, these are the 10 most recent commits. You get a hyperlink back to the particular link in GitHub. Uh, so you can see exactly which change uh, they refer to. We say when they have happened. You can see the commit message. Uh, because again, if you're just looking at the applied revision and uh, the Shasam, then it can be a bit tricky to understand exactly what changes occurred. So we felt that this, this helped you marry the two and give you that greater level of insight. Um, also asking to see the graph. Let me do a refresh. Um, so you can have a look. So it starts at the top level, as I say, our application, and then everything that is associated with that. So this is what we're querying for the status of the deployment. Um, if I bring it up to the top, uh, it's, we created the test namespace that was declared in YAML. We have two services for the backend and front end, which have both successfully been deployed. We have our deployments for the backend and the front end, which trigger a replica set in the pod. Uh, the back end has a horizontal pod ultra scaler. Uh, these are our GitOps automation objects. So this is uh, the Flux resources, our customization, uh, and our Git repository, uh, and then our application CR as well. I noticed these are all colored green with a green check mark. Would they be red if something's going wrong? Um, that's a good question because nothing ever goes wrong. I believe so. 
okay. I, I think I've seen a yellow. a yellow. I'm not sure I've seen a red. Okay. Hopefully that helped, Sherry, but please let me know if there was anything else that you would like to show a bit more uh, in detail. And I will make this side a bit bigger as well. So we're going through it. So we have deployed the application and we can see it. So yeah. let's actually access the application. Sherry was asking about the right hand side. Do you mean the right hand side of the other screen? Not sure what's on the right hand side. Or did you mean this? Yeah, I, assume it's, okay, yeah. I assume it's the docs, so oh, I can make them a bit bigger, but I would probably say it's best to, to follow along as well. Because we lose a lot of real estate yeah. as I get too big. So to access the, the running application, you just need to do a port forward. So this means that you can access the, the service that's running in Kubernetes. Uh, Copy this into a terminal. And then you can go to localhost 9898 to view your running application. So we say it looks something like the one in the Getting Started Guide. The difference here is that we've replaced uh, the image with the WeWorks logo. Oh, but otherwise, good. it's the same. I'm so sorry. It wasn't me that made the change. My poor, my poor cuttlefish. <laughs> branded out. I, I bet we have history and we can prove that it was you that made the change, David. Yeah, I know exactly who it was. <laughs> <laughs> I want me. Our cuttlefish is our unofficial GitOps mascot. Yeah. Now this is the pod info application, which I should say is it's a really nice sample application for microservice uh, deployment on Kubernetes. So it has a bunch of endpoints so you can see some metrics on how your app is performing. You can query the liveness and the readiness probe. So you can see that your pod is up and running. Uh, makes it very good uh, for demos. And now what we are going to do is show a couple of changes. So before I do that, can someone let us know if you would like a little bit more time to catch up? Everyone got past the GitHub challenges? Any other errors? Anyone forget to fork first the pod info sample app? Well, looking good. Please don't be shy. Just say in the chat and I will slow down. So I'm just going to kill the port forward so I can reclaim the terminal. Um, I'm going to show you what happens if you interact directly with the Kubernetes API to delete one of these deployments that we've said we want uh, to be um, our live state. So to do this, um, you don't have to do this first command. This is just to show it in action. But this is a watch on the pods so that you'll see them recycle. Uh, so if I do that, you should see the back end and the front end. I will then open up a new terminal. Bigger. And I'm going to do a delete against the deployment. So as you saw in the reconciliation graph, this was kind of like the top level uh, for the Kubernetes application. In case you're wondering, K is an alias for kubectl, dash n is shorthand for dash dash namespace, you can use either. So issue the delete and we'll see that the front end pod is deleting, but oh no, container is creating. So I was not able to do it. And delete again and then it comes back. There we go. 
Ah, and that's why different pods. <laughs> so it's a little bit tricky to see because all the pods have a different name, but this one that was actually running in status zero and then comes up. So what you can see is you can, you can enforce like good controls on what's actually happening in your cluster, because even if someone goes in and tries to delete it, the GitOps reconciliation loop will kind of recognize this and it will reapply uh, your deployment manifest so that your application stays running. This is a really powerful uh, concept of GitOps. You can extend this even more with like policies and admission controllers. Um, so like if you look at a project called OPA, a uh, number of people use this. So you can even, you can stop people from being able to delete applications or interact with things that they shouldn't be able to. Um, you can also just use standard Kubernetes RBAC as well. Kill that watch. Uh, we will now make a desired change to the application. So one that is permitted to happen. So for this one, we're going to change the color. So if I go to my uh, Git repository, I go to front-end deployment, that's it. And edit the file. If you scroll down, you'll eventually see too big. This environment variable, which is set, which determines the color. We can replace it with a bunch of eights. Then we're going to raise a PR. So again, good GitOps practices. PRs are a fantastic thing. Um, we recognize that so many changes or so many issues in development get caught by peer review. And what we're trying to do here is apply that same principle to operations. Um, so that you can reduce the number of production outages that you end up with just by such a simple thing of second pair of eyes. Um, but also, as we'll show, having this full audit history in Git as a version control system means it's so easy to revert any changes that happen to get back to uh, a desired state. So if I go ahead and make this a bit smaller so I can comprehend it. Create pull request. Uh, and decide I'm happy with it, I'll merge it. Then again, I would imagine my pods will recycle. And I should be able to do another port forward. So you go up in your history, quickest way to get back. If I, ah, there we go. So I've now got this lovely gray um, for my application. So we can see there that both a undesired change has been reverted uh, and as a, a desired change uh, has been applied. And as I was mentioning, because this is all in Git, the wonderful thing, if I decide, actually, I hate that, I can just revert it. You can do a Git revert on the commit ID as well. If you prefer, merge that change. And again, we should see a reconciliation. So it depends when the loop actually happens because the the Git reconciliations every 30 seconds and the customizations every minute. So sometimes it's different in terms of how quickly it will be done. There we go. This is also one of the really powerful things in Flux, that high level of customization. So you can, you can set these at different intervals just to control how much CPU cycles you're using on the reconciliation process itself or based on the nature of the individual application that you're looking to reconcile. We do provide defaults, but these are very easy to override. Apologies if you can hear my toddler fighting his bedtime.
I think this is very fun. So just checking in. Anybody not able to get through these steps to be able to see GitOps in action here? Instead of blue green, we've got blue gray. <laughs> Okay, so this is basically the end of the demo. So thank you everyone for coming and following along. Um, any more questions, please put them in the chat or come join us in Slack or GitHub and we'll be happy to, uh, to take them there. Yeah. So please raise your hand if you made it here to the end. <laughs> and if you have not, um, we're happy to see what time we have. Yeah, we've got Plenty of time to make sure that we troubleshoot any last. All right, Alex got to the end. Uh, yeah, tell us your thoughts. Uh, if this is uh, something, like I said, if you would like to share this with your team, uh, we're happy to come and uh, demo this for you. Give sort of the bigger picture as well on uh, how your teams can benefit from something like this and GitOps in general. You can certainly walk your teams through these steps, but we're happy to guide as well if you want any kind of private uh, demo for this. Uh, as you know, David is a PM and always looking for feedback. So it'd be great for us to know um, what kind of circumstances or use cases would be best suited. Others where maybe there's some feedback for different capabilities. And um, yeah, so we got one comment to the end. I'm going to call out some friends if they're still here. Uh, oh, I guess not. Uh, I know we had uh, David, Sherry, you know, Alex, you made it through. Uh, I see some familiar names in Pargash and Essence. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Anybody? Uh, would like to have help? If not, uh, yeah, please leave us comments here uh, on your thoughts and we'll be, um, I think we already shared the link. Stacey, if you could share one more time to get people, if you like to join our Slack channel, we're happy to uh, continue the conversation there. If uh, you also have a toddler that doesn't wanna sleep or <laughs> has a cat that needs feeding or something and need to come back to this in a bit, we're happy to uh, help now. And uh, yeah, I would love to hear what is it about uh, GitOps or the intro to Kubernetes that you were looking for. Um, and if you didn't feel like you got what you were looking for, um, it's great to see uh, people who stuck around to this bitter end. So um, if you did or you didn't, uh, yeah, please let us know. Um, you'll get a follow-up email and you can reply directly to me. Happy to get that or uh, chat me up on uh, Slack. And just... Um... What Alex is saying, like one of the, the great things about the GitOps community is it is very friendly, I would say. So if you look at the Open GitOps working group that has members from organizations using Flux as well as Argo CD, all, all sharing their expertise and how we can how we can move forward to make Kubernetes easier for folks to manage. Um, if you have any questions or if you want to chat just about what you're looking for, that would be great to hear what you're trying to achieve. Um, yeah, please reach out if you like. And uh, obviously, David was showing the docs. We um, now have recorded. Uh, well, these are all recorded, and you'll you'll get these. Um, we have recorded walkthroughs of all the steps. Uh, so yeah, let us know if if these types of in person workshops are very helpful. Um, that's obviously also important for us to know. Or if people just feel like, oh, just send me a recording and I'll I'll do it on my own time. Uh, let us know that as well. I know that <laughs> some people just say, I just need a set date and time so I know I'm going to do it because otherwise, if it's self service, I'll just keep putting it off. Or if um, there are other ways that you like getting the immediate help, uh, any kind of feedback would be great. So, yeah, hopefully, you can see that. So we'll yep. we'll follow up with an email with a link. Um, this is the main um, we've GitOps core site that has the um, getting started link, we put that there because it will point you to the latest, greatest getting started. Because as you know, we're updating these all the time. Uh, we'll send you also a link with this Slack if you haven't joined already. 
And uh, thank you very much. Thank you to Stacy for putting this together as always, uh, to Mark Emice for our intro talk and to David for our uh, walkthroughs. And thank you to all of, your, all of you for engaging with us and giving your comments and uh, going through all the steps. We hope it was successful and uh, love to have your feedback. With that, thank you, appreciate it. We'll see you next time. <laughs>